The Taliban's rapid takeover of Afghanistan has affected nearly every aspect of life for the Afghan people, especially, sadly, for Afghan women and girls who had come to believe they could at the very least seek an education. As CNN's Christiane Amanpour reports, 20 years of social progress were seemingly wiped out overnight and now women, females, young and old, are desperately seeking alternatives. Wednesday morning in Kabul and we're going to girls' school through these plastic curtains and past prying eyes. Yes, this fashion studio has become an alternate education facility since the Taliban stopped girls from attending government high schools. 17-year-old Roxa wanted to be a doctor. Now she's learning to be a dressmaker. We're feeling very bad, she tells us. Girls are not able to go to school, staying home, doing nothing. We hope that this will change our life so we can be self-sufficient, have a profession, learn, earn money to support ourselves and our families. Neda wanted to be a professional soccer player. You're 17. You've never known the Taliban government. Did you ever imagine that this would happen to you, that you would be prevented from going to school? No, never. We tried our best for our future, but it's a dark one now because we're kept away from our schools. Nagina Hafizi started this fashion business with her sisters four years ago. Today, she's running the resistance. When the Taliban slammed the door in their faces, she opened hers up to high school girls, aiming to have them sufficiently trained to earn a living and support themselves within six to 12 months. She does this for 120 girls and women across three locations. You're helping them, but they all want to be doctors or an athlete or, you know, professionals. They want to go on to university. How do you feel about them having to be embroiderers or dressmakers? This is very upsetting, says Nagina. When someone is following their own dreams, it's very good. It's different when they're forced into doing something else, and it's a bad feeling because most of these girls want to go to university, become a doctor, a teacher, an engineer. It's very difficult for them, and I know that they can't do any other work, so at least they can learn the dressmaking profession for their future. For the record, the powerful deputy Taliban leader Sirajuddin Haqqani told me that girls' public high schools would open again soon, and that of course women have the right to work within the Islamic framework. But 26 years ago, I had the same conversations about the same issues when the Taliban was first in charge. A lot of people want to know what you're going to do about the women issue. What about women's education, girls' education, women working, widows who have no other way to support themselves? I know that, especially in Western news media, it's the propaganda against that, that, that we are against women's education, which is not right, it's not correct. But the girls can't go to school. We've been to schools here that are all closed. We have just uh, told them that for the time being, they should not come to office in school. So till the time that we can come out with some sort of solution. Even the youngest understands something is not right. Ten-year-old Aziza complains about having to stay home all day. We just do housework, cleaning, baking bread, and sweeping the floors, she says. I love my work. It's my right to work. And I need to work because uh, I got education in this country and the government spent money on me and uh, even my family. And I want to express myself to my society. Brave then, brave now. Only now, after more than two decades of progress for their wives, their daughters, and their family incomes, so many more Afghan men support them. Haji Noor Ahmad tells us not even 1% of Afghan people are against women working. We don't want our people to grow up as if we're in a jungle. We want people to have culture, knowledge. We need food and work. Back at the design studio, these classes are not only open to high school students, but to older women who are suddenly out of work, like 30-year-old Rabia, who's a teacher. We feel suffocated, she says. Why can't we, in our own country, our own place, live freely, move freely? Wherever we go, whatever work we do, they put barriers in our way. We can't reach our goals in life. We're always afraid, whether the previous government or the Taliban's emirate regime. Rabia comes here to retrain and, like many of the mothers and wives, to have some kind of social life, like Noor Jan, 
whose daughter Neda wanted to become a soccer player. When I'm really upset, she tells me, my husband says I should come here so that at least I can meet others. My husband is so kind. We are all sisters here. So, Jake, imagine this is now after 20 years of U.S. and Western investment and of real genuine progress. The women's education was real genuine progress from the U.S. Uh, time here. And yet, as you see, that's that special government accountability report. And we talked to a female women's rights leader who said the same thing, that the Doha agreement without any conditions on the Taliban that they actually met was responsible for this, uh, for this collapse. And we've even talked to Taliban and their uh, associates who said that the president, Ashraf Ghani, just leaving like that did, in fact, lead to the collapse. So there's a lot of thought and hopefully accountability to go around after this because the girls and the people and the humanitarian crisis is the price that's been paid in Afghanistan, Jake.